as a griot, the, one of the oldest members um, here, uh, of what led up to the ASA's controversial boycott resolution. Um, after that, I'll switch the focus to the real issue the boycott resolution seeks to address, the unbearable conditions Palestinians face under occupation, conditions that utterly preclude academic freedom. Although my scholarship has centered on the race question in 19th century America, rather than on the Palestinian question, I have been following the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a concerned American Jewish observer since 1982. I want to emphasize my Jewish heritage because baseless accusations of anti-Semitism have been leveled against both the ASA and some of the original participants in today's panel. I was raised in a Zionist milieu, and indeed my mother's uncles belonged to the same Zionist group in Milwaukee that Golda Meir did. But like an increasing number of Jews of conscience, I have come to reject Zionism as a false solution to the problem of anti-Semitism and as a threat to Jewish ethical values. One of the people who started me on this road in 1982 was the Israeli Jewish human rights lawyer, Leah Tzemel, whom I heard speak at a teach-in on Israel's invasion of Lebanon that year. The ASA's engagement with the ethical problems raised by the Israeli occupation is much more recent. I can date the eruption of the Palestinian question into ASA quite precisely to the fall 2004 annual meeting in Washington during Amy Kaplan's presidency. The reason for this precision is that inspired by the meeting theme Amy suggested, violence and belonging, I proposed a panel on American Jews, Israel, and the Palestinian question. Although I sent feelers out to a large number of Jewish scholars who I knew to be critical of Israel, I had a great deal of difficulty finding four who would agree to be on such a panel. Those who refused expressed fears that the negative flack they would encounter would prejudice other important political work they were doing. Ultimately, however, the panel took place, attracted such a large audience that two rooms were combined to accommodate it, and stimulated a very lively and honest discussion. What gave me most pleasure is that a significant contingent of Palestinian and Arab American scholars attended it. Their presence points to the second reason why I can date the eruption of the Palestinian question into ASA so precisely. That year's annual meeting was the first to include two sessions pertaining to Arab Americans in Palestine. Sessions on these topics have multiplied ever since. Moreover, some of the scholars presenting at that 2004 session, who were then graduate students, are now associate professors with one or more books to their credit. Meanwhile, the increasing prominence the Palestinian question has assumed in American studies scholarship was dramatically reflected in the December 2010 number of American Quarterly, which featured a forum on Chicano-Palestinian connections that included five essays and two photo essays. I can date the first steps toward the ASA boycott resolution with the same precision, because I uncharacteristically saved the program for the 2009 annual meeting. That meeting included a session on academic freedom and the right to education, the question of Palestine, at which Omar Barghouti, the founder of the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, and three American Studies scholars spoke in favor of moving the ASA toward supporting such a boycott. The formal session was followed by a workshop in which the attendees broke into small groups, one of which drafted a very rough boycott resolution. I remember thinking at the time that no such resolution had the slightest chance of being approved by the ASA National Council, let alone the membership. But barely four years later to the day, the ASA held a packed open discussion of a much refined boycott resolution, during which 44 randomly chosen people spoke, only seven of whom spoke against it. And as we know, the ASA National Council revised the text of the resolution in accordance with suggestions made during the open discussion, unanimously endorsed it, and put it to the vote of ASA members, who voted by a more than two to one margin to support it. Contrary to the claims of opponents, the ASA resolution does not target individuals on the basis of nationality, ethnic group, or religion. The ASA resolution targets institutions that are complicit in the violation of Palestinian human and academic rights. According to the boycott 
guidelines, individual Israeli scholars, students, or cultural workers may participate in the ASA conference or give public lectures at campuses, provided they are not expressly serving as representatives or ambassadors of those institutions or of the Israeli government. As a matter of fact, the ASA is planning to bring Israeli scholars to its 2014 conference. In short, it is simply not true that the ASA boycott of Israeli academic institutions constitutes an attack on academic freedom. The people who are attacking academic freedom are those who have sought to force the cancellation of panels like this one, and even more egregiously, the, legislature, the legislators currently seeking to pass laws denying public funds to universities whose faculties or departments support boycott, divestment, sanctions initi initiatives by the ASA or other organizations. Amid the ferocious backlash directed at the ASA for its boycott resolution, it is easy to lose sight of the dramatic shift in the climate of opinion that this resolution registers, both within and outside of the ASA. The more than two to one margin by which ASA members voted for the resolution is one index of such a shift. Another is the fact that the ASA has added more than 620 new members since the boycott vote and raised more membership revenue in the last two months than in any two month period in the last 25 years, despite the withdrawals of some disgruntled members and the loss of institutional memberships as a result of an anti-ASA campaign. How can we explain such a dramatic shift in the climate of opinion. To answer that question, I would like to draw an analogy with the 19th century US controversy over slavery, which has been a primary focus of my scholarship. The anti-slavery writer activist whose biography I wrote, Lydia Maria Child, used to like to say, the slaveholders have always been our best allies. By that, she meant that the intransigence, extremism, and increasingly open brutality of the slaveholders and their supporters did as much to awaken the American public to the true nature of slavery as the writings of the abolitionists. Examples are legion, but perhaps most relevant to the backlash against the ASA resolution were the attempts by slaveholders and their supporters to suppress discussion of the slavery question. They did so by denying abolitionists the right to lecture in churches and public halls, by fomenting a campaign of mob violence against abolitionists that in one notorious case culminated in murder, by destroying abolitionist printing presses, and even by imposing a gag rule in Congress. In effect, from 1836 to 1844, the gag rule provided that abolitionist petitions su submitted to Congress be tabled without discussion and prohibited from being written into the congressional record. Ultimately, however, these tactics backfired by arousing public outrage over the suppression of free speech and hence by swelling the ranks of anti-slavery activists. I believe the analogy I have drawn with the anti-slavery movement helps explain the growth of the boycott divestment sanctions movement, which the ASA boycott resolution reflects. The brutality of Israel's 2008 to 2009 invasion of Gaza, Operation Cast Lead, which destroyed the infrastructure of Gaza and cost the lives of some 1,400 Palestinians compared to 13 Israelis, shocked many who had hitherto been unwilling to criticize Israel. Coming on top of caste lead, the Israelis' heavy-handed reaction to the Gaza aid flotilla when they killed nine unarmed passengers aboard the Turkish ship Mavi Marmara, jailed everyone on the various aid boats, and conf confiscated people's cameras and computers compounded the revulsion. In the wake of these two episodes, membership in Jewish Voice for Peace, until then regarded as an idealistic fringe group, skyrocketed. It now stands at more than 130,000. Uh, 130, Another factor that has contributed to the growth of sympathy for the Palestinian people and membership in organizations that work in solidarity with them, as do Jewish Voice for Peace, Students for Justice in Palestine, and Students Against Israeli Apartheid, about which Craig is going to be speaking, is the spread of social media. Thanks to social media, it is no longer possible to suppress news of atrocities committed against Palestinians or of the day-to-day -day indignities inflicted on them. An article that recently appeared in Student Life and was reprinted in Electronic Intifada offers a case in point. Titled, 
I risk imprisonment by Israel and death to study in the United States. The article describes the ordeal of a Palestinian student from a refugee camp in Bethlehem had to, and had to endure after winning a scholarship to the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. He writes, quote, I went through the proper bureaucratic channels to apply to enter Jerusalem, where the United States Consulate is, or is located. The Israelis denied me permission on four separate occasions. They claimed I was a security threat, but offered no explanation why. I have never committed any crime or been to jail. When I explained the situation to the American officials, they told me that's not their problem. In order to apply for a visa, I needed to be at their consulate at 10 a.m. on 16 July. So I had to sneak around like a criminal, evading soldiers. I went miles away to find a small opening in the security wall. I went through hills. I went through torn trees. I crawled through a, a sewage pipe, knowing that others caught in such pipes have suffocated to death after Israeli soldiers discovered them and shot tear gas cans into the pipes or sick dogs on them. This brave and persistent student finally arrived in Jerusalem, reached the consulate, and received his US visa. I'm lucky, he says modestly. Thousands of other Palestinians who want to study aren't so lucky. On a recent trip to Bethlehem, my husband and I met one of the not so lucky, a young man who had received a scholarship from George Mason University and had likewise been repeatedly denied a permit to go to the US consulate, but who had not risked his life to make the trip illegally and was thus stuck in Bethlehem selling souvenirs to tourists. The author of the article I've been quoting ends by asking why US college presidents have condemned the ASA boycott for allegedly violating academic freedom. What about my academic freedom, he asks. What about the tens of thousands of Palestinian children and teachers whose movement to and from their schools is impeded by the Israeli military? Forget academic, what about basic freedom? Here are some of the facts to which he's re referring. Palestinian children in the occupied territories face delays and harassment at checkpoints, frequent school closures, Im arrest, imprisonment, and even death at the hands of trigger-happy soldiers. 29% of Palestinian children in the occupied territories, especially in the refugee camps, have access only to schools run by the UN Relief Works Agency, which is so drastically underfunded that schools operate in double shifts and go only up through ninth grade. Oh. Please. Um, I, I, I just can't do it in one minute. Could you? When you were told. All right. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll skip all the other uh, information about uh, Palestinian schools, um, and I'll simply say that. Um, uh, I'll talk about them at, during the discussion. Uh, I, I, and I'll say that uh, although we learned these facts on a trip to Israel and Palestine, in, um, it's not indispensable to travel there to gain such insights because our college campuses offer us similar opportunities. When American students and teachers interact in college classrooms with people like the young man whose article I've been quoting and hear their stories, stereotypes of Palestinians as terrorists crumble new understanding of the occupation develops. Barriers between Palestinians and Jews give way to friendships forged by working together in solidarity organizations. And yes, outrage builds against the tactics by which the Israeli government and its US supporters attempt to stifle discussion so that they can keep perpetuating the status quo. In this sense, the, authority, the Israeli authorities are quite right to regard Palestinian recipients of US scholarships as security threats. Um, the same kinds of interactions have occurred within the ASA. Uh, when I joined the ASA in 1974, it was largely a club of liberal and not so liberal white males. Now the most, scholarly, the most diverse scholarly association in the country, the ASA's ranks include Americans of every racial, ethnic, and religious group. Many of them cut their eye teeth in campus movements for peace, justice, and equality. Others, among them some members of the ASA National Council, traveled to Israel and Palestine on fact-finding tours that left them profoundly shaken by the horrors they witnessed. That, in sum, 
is why such an overwhelming majority of ASA members voted to boycott Israeli academic institutions as a means of inducing the Israeli government and public to repudiate the policies that have caused so much suffering and to envision in their place a society in which all citizens enjoy freedom, justice, equal rights, and friendships no longer bounded by religion or ethnicity. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Please know everyone keeps their strengths and strengths. And we now turn to Professor Rosen of the George Mason University. the uh, opportunity to speak. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Carolyn, for that. It was really helpful for me. Um, <clears throat> so um, I, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my involvement in the ASA, um, uh, but mostly what I'll talk about today is sort of contextualize the ASA resolution in the broader uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, uh, movement, um, which has been mostly absent from debates about the resolution. So I'm going to try to bring that in. Um, I teach in cultural studies at George Mason. Uh, I'm trained as a sociologist, so I'll bring a little bit of my own work on social movements. Mostly I research social movements around housing in the US, but I'll draw a little bit from my understanding of social movements and then my own participation um, uh, in, in BDS work, specifically as an advisor to Students Against Israeli Apartheid, a student organization at George Mason. Um, uh, and one thing that I wanted to make clear, um, uh, this was put together you know, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and Carolyn and I both have been members of the ASA. Neither of us are representatives. Neither of us are members of governing bodies. Um, I've been a member of ASA uh, since 2008 when I was in graduate school. And I've been very active in it. Um, I was not part of drafting the resolution, although I was part of the support work around the resolution at the meeting uh, uh, that was held here in DC in November. Um, so I worked at a table to provide information for people who had questions about the resolution. I helped, you know, design and distribute stickers for people supporting the resolution. I spoke at the uh, open forum. Um, so, um, and obviously I voted for it. So, you know, um, while I'm not um, an official representative of the ASA, I'm, you know, a very invested member. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to, to make clear for us, first of all, is that um, the ASA resolution comes out of the work of the uh, Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, what we sometimes just call PACB, um, and then it's sort of US branch, the US campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel, or US ACB. Um, and so uh, PACB has developed guidelines for institutions and organizations to develop resolutions in support of their call for a boycott of cultural and academic institutions. So the American Studies Association and other associations that have passed resolutions or considering resolutions, they, um, they draw those guidelines from these, from these organizations. Um, and I won't go through these, but just um, they're there for you. These are the basic guidelines um, for, um, from PACB. And so um, if you look at the text of the ASA resolution, um, you'll see that it fits within these guidelines. Um, and I actually have a, um, a sort of fact sheet about the resolution, so maybe I'll just, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and again, this is, I just pulled this from the ASA website. I'll show you the address for that at the end of the talk. Um, there's lots of resources about um, the resolution itself, um, as well as some of the other organizations involved in this work um, for you. So again, I just kind of pulled this off as an ASA member. thought it might be helpful for some of us here. Um, so uh, the call for an academic boycott is part of the broader BDS movement, which stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. The BDS movement is a Palestinian grassroots social movement the call for BDS was made in 2005, uh, made from a coalition of Palestinian organizations, uh, labor groups, women's rights groups, uh, community and social service groups. Um, and they've called for the international community to support them in solidarity um, through calling for a boycott of Israeli goods and institutions, divestment from corporations that are profiting uh, from the occupation and apartheid systems, and sanctions against the government of Israel. Um, and um, it, it's significant to know that the, the founding of the BDS movement um, was in, on July 9th, 2005. Uh, that's the one year anniversary, so one year after Jul the July 9th, 2004 decision of the United Nations International Court of Justice, um, which called on Israel to stop construction of the wall in the occupied West Bank, uh, including East Jerusalem. Uh, the United Nations International Court of Justice also called for dismantling the structure built in the occupied territories and to make reparations for all damage caused 
by the wall's construction. So a year after this ruling of the International Court of Justice, um, as Palestinian activists and organizers saw absolutely no material results, and in fact continued construction um, and continued militarization of the wall, um, they, tor they turned to this grassroots social movement call. Um, and so I think it's really important, again, that we situate the ASA boycott um, in the context of an international solidarity movement that is a response uh, to the work, uh, the theorizing, and the call for actions of activists from Palestine, uh, living in Israel, living in occupied territories, living in Gaza. Um, and uh, I think that that has, um, the fact that that's been largely absent um, from a lot of the debate, um, and certainly most of the criticism about the ASA resolution, reflects both a lack of understanding of what social movements are uh, in sort of US popular discourse. Um, I think it also reflects um, a lack of imagination that Palestinians could be social actors who might know something about uh, what they need uh, in their own struggles for justice. Um, so I want to make sure that we like recenter that uh, in, our, in our conversation today. Um, I think that we can also understand the BDS movement. Um, you know, social movements develop for lots of different reasons, um, through lots of you know, uh, sort of conjoined and sometimes conflicting forces. But one way, sort of basic way, we can understand grassroots social movements, um, they arise when available mechanisms for social change fail to produce social change. So those mechanisms might be state apparatuses, right, legislative bodies. Um, they might, in this case, also be you know, international governing bodies, such as the UN, right? So, um, so we can understand that um, this nonviolent uh, grassroots social movement um, as calling on people as individuals and people who are situated within institutional context to act when states and international uh, governing bodies have failed um, to act or fail to act effectively. Um, so I think we, we need to situate BDS in the post-Oslo context of um, the continued construction of settlements in occupied territories. Um, there were 262, just over 262,000 settlers living in the occupied territories in 1993. Uh, today, that has almost doubled to 520,000. Uh, the Israeli government provides subsidies of up to 28,000 for each apartment built in a settlement. Um, and since 1993, so since the Oslo Accords, Israel has demolished over 15,000 Palestinian structures across the occupied territories. And today, there's about 4,500 outstanding orders for demolition. Um, so the demands of BDS um, are, are pretty straightforward uh, to end Israel's occupation and colonization of all Arab lands occupied since 67 and the dismantling of the wall, the recognition of the fundamental rights of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality, and respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return. So these three sort of basic tenets of BDS recognize the sort of uh, post-1948 uh, context of sort of Palestinian population life. So it recognizes those living within Israel proper, those living within the occupied territories, and refugees living around the world. Um, one of the, the key sort of practices of BDS as a social movement, um, one of its uh, one of the ways that it is most effective right now in a way that I think we can contextualize both the importance of the ASA resolution and also contextualize the backlash um, is, the, is the concept of normalization and anti-normalization. So um, anti-normalization, we can think of it in two different ways. Um, uh, it challenges an ideological or sort of a kind of colonization of the mind that imagines no other alternative could exist, right? And that may happen through um, you know, a sort of direct uh, propagandistic rewriting of the history of the region as you know a barren empty land with no people on it prior to 1948 um, but we could also think of this as like normalization operates in a political discourse that makes us uh, figured as like a religious conflict or a conflict with two sides that are in some sort of disagreement um, and what that does instead is it erases the actual context of colonialism um, and of the apartheid system and so the the real work especially for B uh, BDS as a solidarity movement outside of Israel and Palestine uh, is this work of anti-normalization. What that means is changing the conversation, changing the accepted mode of discourse in the US. Um, and uh, I think, um, again, not as a representative of the ASA, but just someone kind of reflecting on the resolution, uh, I think the actual material day-to-day -day impact of the resolution on the, on the operations of the ASA will be pretty minimal. Right? What the, is significant about the ASA resolution um, is it's the sort of, the, again, this anti-normalization stance of refusing that it's appropriate 
or normal to talk about collaboration with institutions that are directly involved in building and upholding apartheid systems or occupations. Um, and I think that the, um, you know, it's interesting, a lot of the critique or backlash against the resolution has both accused the resolution of being silly and pointless and meaningless and as being like one of the greatest forms of evil, right, circulating right now. Um, and so I think that in some ways uh, uh, it has recognized the truth of the resolution, which is that it op it's operating at this cultural and, and, and symbolic level to change a conversation. Um, oops, uh, go back to this. Um, so one of, the, one of the key sites of BDS work uh, in the U.S. has been college campuses. Um, and uh, I think there's lots of reasons why social movements often um, find homes on college campuses and why college campuses have provided important sort of resources for feeding social movements. Um, so I think that um, uh, I just want to like end with a, with a few quick comments about why I think the ASA resolution is also important in terms of building faculty and institutional support for the work of uh, student organizers and activists who have also been on the front line of this issue and have borne a lot of the direct consequences of, of speaking out uh, against Israel. Um, and, uh, and this is something I think that doesn't require uh, even uh, support of Palestinian justice or support of this resolution to understand that it's important that students have the right to organize on their campuses um, and that that actually is a key and important part of people's educational experiences. Um, so at George Mason, um, I advise Students Against Israeli Apartheid. That group has organized a petition against Sabra Hummus. They organized a walkout and an IDF soldier who was brought to campus to speak. They organized a protest against our commencement speaker who, comes, uh, who came from the Arison Group, which is a, a occupation profiteer. They organized weekly meetings, discussion groups. Um, they've organized film screenings. They brought speakers to campus. They're very deeply enmeshed in the day-to-day um, operations of our campus community. Um, and uh, for this, they have been rewarded with, um, you know, calls for violence against them uh, on social media uh, hosted on campus, um, excessive police presence at their protests, these kinds of things. Um, the president of our university who approved the walkout at commencement uh, then um, disavowed it in the student press. Um, and so um, uh, I, I mentioned this because I think um, uh, the, if, if some of the key work of BDS is anti-normalization, um, one of the uh, ways that the ASA resolution um, supports that work is it, it helps do um, what uh, we at George Mason have been talking about, the normalization of Palestinian justice work, right? So, um, so I think any of us who've engaged um, in, in justice work around Palestine have had this kind of, um, this experience of how difficult it is to articulate what we understand are the basic truths that uh, this is an apartheid system, that this is a military occupation, that this is a context of settler colonialism. And so part of, I think, what is significant about this resolution is it opens up space for conversations that have been shut out of college campuses because it, it puts faculty, um, uh, it makes us also have a stake in the legitimacy of those conversations, again, regardless of where you might fall in your political analysis of them. Um, and so I think that um, uh, you know, the resolution and, and this sort of work um, there are opportunities for learning, and while they're often framed, and so all this backlash has been really framed in terms of somehow squelching academic freedom, um, I think that uh, uh, this work, um, it extends our work, those of us who are faculty, um, it extends our work as teachers. I mean, these conversations are taking place, and they didn't take place a few years ago, um, and I think that um, is valid. You know, I'm excited that those conversations are taking place because I support Palestinian justice. Um, but as a teacher, I know that it's better for students to have opportunities to engage with each other, to have access to materials that they've been denied, to have access to histories that have been um, erased and suppressed. Um, and so I think that that is one way, again, that we can think about the ASA resolution beyond just its work for the, for the association, but how it is also a part of our, our role as educators and our role as members of, of campus communities. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> To, uh, uh, Professor William I'm righteous, uh, that wouldn't be a good thing. And then Abraham said, well, if there were 40, and the Lord said, no, that wouldn't be righteous. And then he said 20, and then he said, no, that's true. This guy's annoying me, but still. Uh, and then he said 10, and the Lord admitted that for 10 people he would not destroy Sodom. Uh, and I think that's a very relevant type of, of uh, <coughs> uh, parallel to what's going on in that, that same Holy Land. This is a, a resolution of guilt by association. Uh, it, it talks about uh, individual members uh, uh, targeted uh, or tarred by, tarred by, the, uh, uh, by the position or the existence or whatever of the association. So uh, poor Mr. Rich is, is tarred by being member of the ASA according to this, uh, uh, this type of, of resolution. 
um, and the individual is uh, associated within the, the position of the, of the group. This uh, parallel with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, abolitionism is, is false. I'm surprised at the, the type of research that it represents. Um, uh, it, uh, it would be uh, appropriate if it were, uh, 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 it, if it related to some activities in favor of the, the in favor of the Palestinian position itself, in, in favor of the political position. Uh, uh, but uh, the abolitionist movement was, was, was against a practice, but not a particular institution that members uh, or body that the members were associated with. Um, and I guess Israel should boycott the ASA by the same kind of impeccable uh, logic of association. Um, it is part of the social movement. That's uh, that's true. Uh, that I, I study social movements too. That doesn't mean they're all right, or or it means that they're an activity that's going on and has a certain dynamic behind it. Um, I guess uh, those who support it would be uh, perfectly happy with a boycott of the United States uh, during the Vietnam War, if you remember the Vietnam War. Not just U.S. policies, but the whole United States or, or, or United States institutions, uh, or a boycott of the United States now. Uh, uh, I guess the Iraq War is so-called over uh, uh, because of the, during the, uh, the Iraq War. Uh, and not a demonstration against the policy, but a boycott of the, uh, the whole institution. Um, I wonder if these same people who are doing this are so broad-minded as to uh, have a boycott of uh, academics or institutions or something like that from Syria, uh, where the losses by the Syrian government on the Syrian population are substantial. Uh, or in Egypt, maybe you'd have a hard time finding free Syrian academics. But uh, certainly there are in, in Egypt, and yet the Egyptian government is being pretty reprehensible by the same kind of standards. Um, guilt by association uh, and uh, inconsistency uh, in the arguments, and it turns us away from a direct protest against particular uh, actions uh, by the Israeli government. Go boycott the embassy. The AAUP uh, has taken a position opposed to all academic boycotts and at the same time has recently had to issue two statements rejecting any actions aimed at curtailing the speech of those who advocate academic boycotts. These don't reflect an assessment of the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. The AUP does not have a Middle East policy. Maybe we're the only ones who don't. Personally, I do, but not the association. The AAUP opposition to academic boycotts, like our support of the right of the American Studies Association to advocate a boycott, rests solely on our commitment to academic freedom. So when an Israeli supporter called me this morning and asked me not to come because he was being boycotted and we should boycott back, I explained that I didn't think I could make my point of opposition to boycotts by boycotting. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Specifically, the AUP is, quote, committed to preserving and enhancing the free exchange of ideas among academics, irrespective of governmental policies and however unpalatable those policies may be. We reject proposals that curtail the freedom of teachers and researchers to engage in work with academic colleagues and we reaffirm the paramount importance of the freest possible movement of scholars and ideas. We issued that back in 2005 when AAU, AUT in England first began this. But also in keeping with our commitment to academic freedom, we objected strongly to the suggestion of former president, Harvard President Lawrence Summers uh, that universities should deny travel support to faculty going to ASA meetings which we felt would only compound the violation of academic freedom that the process began. Similarly, we issued a statement opposing legislative efforts in New York and Maryland aimed at ASA that were to forbid the use of state funds to support academic organizations or faculty participating in organizations that support the academic boycott. We noted academic freedom is meaningless if it does not protect those who support unpopular positions, including the advocacy of academic boycotts. Now, the AAUP opposition to academic boycotts in no way presupposes support for Israeli policies or closes opposition to those policies. Our statement says, 
Consistent with our longstanding principles and practice, we consider other forms of protest, such as the adoption of resolutions of condemnation by higher education groups intended to publicize documented threats to or violations of academic freedom, are entirely appropriate. Let me offer a pertinent example. Some of you uh, won't remember this far back. It's around 30 years ago. A uh, group of faculty, including Howard Zinn, well known in the ASA, uh, Noam Chomsky, well known to anybody here, uh, Mary Gray, my AUP colleague, prepared this ad. The ad says, Israel, restore academic freedom to Palestinian universities now. We call on all advocates of academic freedom and peace to speak out now. I signed it. I'd sign it again happily if the uh, ASA chose that approach. The difference here, it's not just a nuance, it's whether you encourage more academic freedom or less. Let me offer a pertinent, uh, let me uh, go on then to another example. Uh, divestment from South Africa. We did support divestment, not an academic boycott of South Africa. I actually helped persuade the English to drop that. But we did support divestment from South Africa. I, too, have the same police record from demonstrating in front of the <laughs> South African embassy. Uh, and I did it as, as on the authority that, uh, from the president of the AAUP that I could go and do that when I was general secretary. Uh, so those seeking more direct support of BDS might consider a resolution supporting such action as uh, a, an economic boycott of West Bank Israeli commerce which many AAUP leaders as individuals, not as an association, do support. In my case only, however, if it were tied to the goal of a negotiated two-state resolution of the conflict. One of the problems I have with the various BDS proposals is the sort of lack of a game plan for what the end of all this is supposed to be. Critics of our policy who do not dismiss it as a simple cover for our alleged pro-Israeli sympathies, and by now no, none of the pro-Israelis in this room can possibly believe we have them, but perhaps <laughs> others do, uh, they tend to argue that our recommendations are either irrelevant because the ASA resolution doesn't really impair individual academic freedom, or because the political circumstances are so dire, the injustice so great as to outweigh our recommendations. Of that, I have to say that although the ASA resolution is specifically limited to an institutional boycott, we do think it impairs individual ac faculty and student academic freedom. For example, FAQ 5 of the ASA uh, statement uh, would forbid us to invite an Israeli ambassador or Israeli university president or the uh, president of Israel himself. Now, we supported having uh, ob um, the president, then president of Iran, speak at Columbia. This would forbid us to invite an Israeli president to one of our campuses to hear what the Israeli side of things are. That is a violation of academic freedom. They also would deny students and faculty an opportunity uh, to engage in institutional collaborations and conferences. And that is a violation of academic freedom. AAUP does understand that proponents view the circumstances underlying their call as exceptional. While I personally doubt the claim that the circumstances are exceptional, it was absolutely Kafkaesque when the Asian Studies Association focused on the Middle East and ignored China. <laughs> <laughs> I accept the contention that the fact that the injustice does not in itself justify Israeli m misconduct. But I don't, and I don't believe critics are required to respond to every injustice at the same time. If ASA or anybody else wants to have a resolution condemning Israeli policy and not condemn the rest of the world at the same time, I have no ground for opposing that. My objection is entirely to the use of the academic boycott. The situation is dire. The opportunity for a just and peaceful resolution of the conflict is dwindling. The hope of a two-state solution, in which I deeply believe, is going away. But the AAUP and I would argue that this urgency calls for more discussion, not less. As we state in our concluding anti-boycott statement, Principle 8, we resist the argument that extraordinary circumstances should be the basis for limiting our commitment to the free exchange of ideas and their free expression. Finally, the most alarming variant of the claim that extraordinary circumstances justify the academic boycott is the claim that we need to understand academic freedom claims in their political context. This is the position now of Joan Scott, 
my co-editor on this original boycott issue, which got boycotted. <laughs> this is an issue on the academic boycott. Almost all of the statements but mine are pro-boycott by Palestinians and Palestinian supporters because the Israeli supporters pulled out because we had the Palestinians in it. Joe and I went ahead and published it as it is. There has just been a symposium you should all look at on the academic free Journal of Academic Freedom website. Again, mostly pro-boycott. Then some of us have jumped in with anti-boycott positions. But Joan's position, which I found stunning, was that extraordinary circumstances uh, justify limits of academic freedom by, that require putting it in its political context. If we start putting claims for academic freedom into their political context, we've lost academic freedom. What does it mean anymore to set a political litmus test for academic freedom? So if I'm amazed at, that the Asian Studies Association fails to mention China, I'm absolutely stunned that the American Studies Association has forgotten American history. Who is victimized when our country has curtailed free speech? From the Alien and Sedition Act, to the Red Scare and McCarthyism, to the tenure battles of the 60s and the 70s, again and again, who has been the victim? The AAUP commitment to academic freedom rests solely on our commitment to the free exchange of ideas. But if anyone here is tempted to qualify that principle by making political conditions for academic freedom, then I personally suggest they review American history and consider who and to what ends has successfully imposed politically conditioned limits on academic freedom. Thank you. Thank you. I am the only person up here in the front of the room who is absolutely unqualified to be at the front of the room. I'm not a member of the uh, ASA. I'm not a member of the AAUP. I'm not a citizen uh, or taxpayer of a state that is trying to boycott the boycotters. Um, and I guess most importantly, um, I don't have a police record. <laughs> so I am absolutely uh, unqualified to be up here. And that's maybe why I'm up here. Um, I have enjoyed being up here, and I wanted to be at this panel because I want to understand the logic of this particular symbolic act, because that's what we're talking about. The boycott is, in many ways, uh, meant to be a symbolic act. We don't think that the boycott itself um, is likely to change Israeli policies, occupation of the West Bank. It is a symbolic statement. and so. It's in light of it being a symbolic statement that I, I really was curious to hear what the people who do have a dog in this fight, which I don't, have to say about it. Um, and for me, as a, as a former dean, um, I'm a recovering dean, as we like to say. I have returned from the dark side to, uh, to the best job in the university, being a professor. I'm curious about what it is we are teaching our students through this symbolic act. Um, and I, I think this is, is really interesting. Um, I, was, I was very impressed by some of the comments that uh, Professor Karcher and Professor Wilsey made um, about when and where they saw progress and teachable moments and researchable moments in this whole process of considering what's been going on in, in Palestine and the region. Um, Professor Karcher, for example, noticed that uh, as a result of concerns in the fall 2004 ASA meetings, there was very healthy discussion at the ASA. That it, uh, following that, there were discussions and scholarly work that came out of this that hopefully uh, helped enlighten people about the concerns in Palestine, helped students think about these issues, and prompted research that might be helpful in bringing uh, a, a morally just outcome in the region, hopefully. Um, similarly, um, Professor Karcher talked about um, how there were conversations in the classroom that were healthy, um, that bringing together Palestinians and Israelis, and presumably Americans as well, prompted friendship, uh, movement. Um, and she talked about how ASA has evolved to become more inclusive, less exclusive, and that becoming more inclusive, including more people, presumably more fraternal organizations resulted in positive changes of perception, that this was a way, way forward in learning. Um, what I'm struck by, though, is that the, the positive aspects of this 
have involved learning and inclusion, using symbolic acts as a way to bring people to the table rather than to move them away. In the same way, listening to um, Professor Wilsey um, talk about, uh, first about how the boycott resolution and the BDS movement was about, in his terms, changing the conversation. I thought that's very important, that changing the conversation, recasting a conversation, can be a great way to move us outside of paradigms that have, have frozen us in conflict. Um, but I'm puzzled because, as I understand it, what the boycott statement is really saying is that an appropriate way to change the conversation is, to some degree, to end the conversation, to say we're not going to talk to certain institutions, we're not going to engage with certain institutions. And that brings me to the, the other part that puzzled me here, that implicit in what I was hearing was something that I agree with very much, that we are always, as professors, we are always looking for teachable moments. We're looking for ways to engage our students, to bring their passions and their moral commitments to the table, and use this as a way to expand their knowledge of a subject, but also as a way to expand their knowledge about how to deal with other problems like this that will be similar in their future. And yet, it strikes me that what the boycott is teaching is that an appropriate response to ideas we find morally abhorrent and to political situations we find morally abhorrent is to walk away, to refuse to listen to people or engage with institutions that we find uh, disagreeable. And again, I, I understand the logic that has led to this position, but I wonder, is that really what we want to be teaching our students? Do we want to teach them that when confronted with ideas that some of us as teachers and some of them as students, perhaps more of them as students, should feel are morally, morally abhorrent, the way to deal with that is to cut off conversation rather than to improve conversation? Again, so I'm, I, I, I am troubled, um, I, I, although I'm not a member of the AAUP, um, I find a great deal of wisdom in the highly nuanced um, highly thoughtful statements on boycotts and boycotts against boycotts um, that the AAUP has come out with. I encourage, if you haven't looked at them, to take a look at them, not necessarily to, 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 to accept the AAUP's position, but it is very, very thoughtful um, about how we deal with ideas that we find morally abhorrent um, or political positions we find uh, very difficult to swallow. Um, so, uh, again, I uh, I, I, I leave this conversation about as troubled as I, I came in. Um, I am also, I have to say, a little bit amused um, because I hadn't realized until this conversation just how stunningly brilliant the boycott was from an institutional perspective. Um, Professor Carter, I, I, I accept that this was not the intention here. But nonetheless, if I were looking for a way to reinvigorate or to, to further invigorate an organization that I was part of, um, what I've learned here is that a boycott is a great way to do it. That by doing, by uh, adopting this boycott, um, the American Studies Association has uh, expanded its membership, expanded its fundraising, and um, brought a lot of media attention to an organization that ordinarily doesn't get very much media attention. So uh, I'm not quite sure what lesson to learn here, but I, 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 I'm going to bring it, again, I'm not a member of the AAUP or the SA, but to some of the professional associations that I am a member of, um, I think there's uh, a useful institutional lesson. Paul, I apologize. Um, again, I'm unqualified to be up here, but uh, I hope that this well, has added yeah, some insights. You, you're the only one without a police record. Yeah. Uh, now we'll turn to the audience participation. Uh, would you try to direct your comment question to somebody on the panel? Now, if you genuinely want everybody to comment on your remarks, uh, be, please do so. But uh, perhaps to facilitate this, if, if you would um, say, Professor So-and-so, uh, I'd like to know your opinion on this, and this is a, a matter of concern to me, uh, if we could try that. Now, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for organizing this um, panel. Um, it was actually a really teaching moment.
for me, um, as, a, as a teacher in training um, at George Mason University, I'm also a cultural studies student. Um, and, and I learned that I should, I should definitely be well prepared um, before attending a panel. Um, so what I um, ended up hearing after um, Dr. Wolstein and Dr. Um, Karcher's um, presentations um, is not a, a, I haven't heard the word Palestinian. I, I think I heard the word Palestine, but I didn't hear the word Palestinian um, or Arab. Um, and so my question is to Professor Zartman, uh, Professor Zorth, and um, Rose, and, and Professor Benjamin. Um, when will you start talking about Palestinians as people? When will we start discussing Palestinians and Palestinian academic freedom as we're talking about um, our abstracted freedoms um, or the concept of freedom um, in the United States? I'm going to take a number of questions and, and so that well, you uh, all right. Uh, uh, Professor Zartman suggests taking several questions, which is always good, and then turning the panel loose. So let's keep track of that. And uh, ma'am, right here, please. Thank you. Um, and this is um, for Professor Benjamin, um, largely because I thought yours was the most articulate um, criticism of a boycott that I do support. And um, what I did want to comment on was this resolution, which was great, except it had no impact at all. And so we could sign lots of resolutions, but what Palestinian civil society has asked us to do is support their cause by a full boycott. And we have done those in the past. We've done full boycotts of South Africa. We've done full boycotts even of Pinochet's Chile. And so this is a call because the Palestinian movement has been so debilitated because it is fighting against an enemy that is so much more powerful because it is invisible. And so what we are trying to do is embrace their call for support. And it's a nonviolent movement. They've been criticized in the past for using violence. They are not using violence, and we're not using violence. <coughs> and I'll take one more, and then we'll put them up here, and then we'll go back. Sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Safi Hamid, and my question is for uh, Professor uh, Karsher. Uh, and uh, I have to admit also that I was here to be educated, although I, although I have been at four, for 40 years a university professor, but not in this field at all, uh, just an observer. Um, I personally don't agree with guilt by association. So if I am a university professor teaching at an Israeli uh, campus, and I'm actually against the conduct of the Israeli government. Why should I be, um, although I'm, I'm opposing it and declaring that in my publications and my writing and my speeches, why should I be boycotted by the SA and Okay, now we have three questions on the table, more to come. Could you put your first question a little more succinctly in one sentence? When will you start talking about Palestinians and Arabs? Okay, that's directed to everybody, or that was two. Um, I think that uh, Professor three Wilson of us. Yeah. Professor okay. Were able to All right. Say that, talk about it, um, but I would like your comments too as well. So. All right. Everybody. Let's do that one first. The question is when. Can I can I start on that? Yes. I I I'm delighted to talk about it anytime. In fact, I I'm not a student of the Middle East, but I've been to. Uh, I've been to Ramallah, I've been to Jerusalem, I've been to Tel Aviv, I've had conversations with Palestinians, with uh, Israelis, um, I've had conversations with Palestinian uh, government officials, with Israeli government officials, with ordinary Palestinians, with ordinary uh, Israelis, both in the West Bank and uh, within the uh, borders of, of Israel. Um, and so I think those conversations are absolutely important, and I have those conversations with my students um, whenever it fits into our curriculum, um, or whenever they come to me and want to talk about it. So I think those conversations are absolutely important. My question is, and it's an open question, and reasonable people will differ. Uh, the American Studies Association has, has one view, the AAUP has another view. How do we best stimulate those discussions? And mm, my view, I, I fear, tends to lean towards the AAUP's position, which is the best way we stimulate those discussions is by putting them frankly on the table and having those conversations with everybody. 
if I were not allowed, or if a professional association that I was a member of strongly discouraged me from going to meet with uh, Israeli government officials or to uh, Israeli uh, scholars who are in an official scholarly position at an Israeli university, um, it would be very difficult for me to share my ideas, um, for me to, to share suggestions on possible ways forward. At George Mason University, in the upcoming week, we are going to have a, um, a prominent uh, scholar from Ben-Gurion University who has been very active in uh, the uh, Green Party in Israel, uh, who has been very active in building Palestinian-Israeli relations um, on environmental issues. Um, and I know the ASA resolution would not prohibit that because he's coming as an individual, um, not as a representative of Ben-Gurion University. I understand that that's not covered by the boycott, but I think conversations, everything we do, can do to encourage conversations. George Mason is, is also not the ASA. I'm I sorry? Mean, George Mason is also not the ASA. I, I, I understand, <laughs> but my, my only point here is I, I, would, I would say let's have the conversations about the Palestinians uh, and about the Israelis. Let's not try to discourage that. That's my teaching moment. You're beginning to sound like somebody who's qualified to talk about it. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not. I, I did, in fact, mention, of course, when I showed this ad, uh, a concern about Palestinians. But I think what your question really is aiming at is talking with them or in response to what uh, the two colleagues from the Af American Studies Association said, listening to them. Uh, the real issue that you're raising is, are we paying attention to the concerns and the needs of Palestinians, not just their just demands, and I think many of their demands are just, but their, the idea is this is their particular way of trying to get protest. Why aren't we hearing what they have to say? And my answer to that is that in, I do hear their claims. That's why I was very careful to suggest as far as an AAUP representative could what I thought you could do about it. Not only having ads like this, but having a boycott of West Bank uh, economic commerce. Though that does raise the problem that the professor raised a moment ago from the audience. Uh, it's hard to do that without hurting the Palestinians mm -hmm. there as well as the Israelis. Nonetheless, uh, that could have been used as an argument in South Africa and I supported what the div divestment there. Mm -hmm. And so I have no trouble about th that. So yes, I, certainly I hear it. And the evidence that we in the AUP hear it is that this volume has several statements by Palestinians including Omar Barghouti and then our statements on the website, and we have reference to all of this back there, their handout sheets, with our policies and with the website addresses to get our statements. There are, uh, in our journal uh, website issue, in the Journal of Academic Freedom, we have half a dozen different Palestinian statements uh, on this subject. So yes, we are listening. I didn't feel here that I should be debating the Israeli-Palestinian question, I thought I should talk about boycotts, but uh, you're quite right that we should be listening to the Palestinians. Could we have yep. your question, the second questioner, uh, could you put in one pithy sentence to the... Um, this has been a really, really, really long struggle. Why do we still keep saying that the same path of making resolutions is going to be more effective? This is an, a call from a movement that it has been victim of tremendous amount of unequal power against it. And they're calling for some help from the outside, and the call is for a full boycott. So why are we rejecting that call when we don't have another effective means to support them? Well, if you're asking me, this is going to get beyond AAUP <laughs> policy. But I will tell you that, first of all, since I'm committed to a two-state solution, a negotiated two-state solution. I'm not prepared to agree with everything either side says. I think they have to negotiate that with each other. The Israelis should start listening to the Palestinians and vice versa. S secondly, in terms of pressure, then what I'm saying is I will support some of the BDS proposals, such as uh, an economic boycott of the West Bank. I won't go all the way with the BDS proposals. That's my political position. Somebody else could have a different one. But I do think that uh, more than resolutions is required. Uh, this is a terrible situation and we ought to be doing something about it. I, I think the first question misses the subject of what we're talking about and the second question misses the target. 
uh, we're talking about a, a, a resolution that targets Israel. Uh, so we can talk about the Palestinians. That's a, and there are plenty of positive measures that uh, can be taken in regard to the to the Palestinians. That's very important. Uh, but uh, I don't know. That's another another panel. And uh, I'd, I would invite the people who who want to do the negative measures to think about positive measures as as well. For example, uh, we're citizens uh, of a country uh, whose representative says that's not my problem. When somebody wants to come up and, and make an application, it it would be quite useful, I think, to get some kind of similar movement that says facilitate the way that uh, people from the West Bank or from ever, maybe from within Israel, can uh, uh, Arabs in, in Israel can can uh, uh, come and fill uh, our applications because it can't people can't fill our applications then it is part of our our problem. Uh, similarly, uh, in regard to the the target of this thing, there's a, it, uh, every year there comes up this resolution to move the capital to move the uh, the embassy to Jerusalem <coughs> in Congress, uh, and it's. Uh, uh, it comes up because it's supported by lots of grassroots uh, activity and lots of activity by targeted uh, uh, PACs. Um, it, uh, it would be good to have our representatives, probably not in Washington, but uh, if people come from elsewhere, learn that uh, we're interested in, in recognizing that Jerusalem is a problem to be solved by negotiation, as the official statement says, and that we should, uh, should stick to it. We have a government that we can, repre uh, that we can uh, target with lots of pro-Palestinian, uh, keep your eyes on the target, two-state solution types of pressures, pro. Yeah, if, if I could um, speak to a couple of things, both to your guilt by association question and the, the why not boycott China um, uh, question. Um, uh, representatives of the ASA have repeated over and over again, but I will repeat it yet another time. Uh, we're not boycotting China. We don't, you know, n nobody's defending Chinese policies in Tibet or Chinese treatment of minorities, but the U.S. government regularly chastises China for such policies. Um, on the contrary, uh, whenever, uh, whenever Israel is, is criticized in the U.N., the U.S. jumps to its defense. The U.S. does not send uh, three, more than $3 billion a year annually to China to support um, policies like the um, uh, the, the treatment of Tibetans and the um, colonization of Tibet. It does uh, send unconditional $3 billion a year to Israel, you know, out of our tax dollars. Um, and this, uh, uh, this money can be used as the Israelis see fit. And much of this, this, this money is military aid, and much of this money is used to, um, to victimize Palestinians, to kill uh, Palestinians. Um, so uh, that's the reason why we have been focusing on Israel. It's because as American citizens, um, our government, rather than condemning uh, these policies or, or acting in ways that would in fact um, uh, do pay more than lip service to condemning these policies, is actively supporting these policies. Um, regarding the guilt by association, uh, again, you know, I. I think the, the um, ASA statement very clearly um, responds to it. But I, I want to mention th that, that um, I, am, I am very much aware, and people at ASA were very much aware, of the fact that there are Israeli um, academics who have uh, basically put their careers on the line to, to defend the rights of Palestinians. Um, what has happened to them? Ilan Pape was forced to resign um, from uh, the University of Haifa. He's now teaching at Exeter uh, in, in England. And uh, he, he says in a recent interview that, that the hounding by the Israeli government has followed, has followed him to England, that the Israeli ambassador is regularly try, you know, meeting with his university in England and trying to get them to, to fire uh, Ilan Pape. Um, there's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with, with Elon Pape's case because I've read several of his books and I admire him very much as a scholar. Um, there's uh, another scholar whose work I'm not familiar with, a sociologist named Anat Matar. Uh, she was also a very early um, 
uh, uh, person to, to uh, speak in favor of BDS. And uh, again, the, uh, the treatment of her uh, in Israel was ferocious. Um, the, uh, the Knesset um, spoke out against her and recommended that she be fired. The same thing, but by the way, with Ilan Pape. Um, uh, her, her colleagues, 250 of her colleagues, um, uh, vituperatively condemned her and, uh, and uh, urged that she be fired. Um, they apparently weren't thinking much of, about academic freedom. Um, and uh, I, th I believe she's still hanging on to her job, but you can imagine what it must be like for her. Um, Let me admit, then turn to the gentleman here. Your question, if you could put it very succinctly for the panel that you raised right. earlier. Yes. Uh, I, I'm just uh, putting myself in the position of an Israeli professor who is actually criticizing the government of Israel, yet uh, has no uh, a relation because you boycotted uh, or channels to interact with the with, with the American. Right. I am trying to answer. I'm I'm trying to to answer that question, and. Um, uh, on this recent trip to, um, to Israel and Palestine with interfaith peace builders, we met um, some uh, members of peace groups in Israel, including um, uh, an, an academic. And uh, what they have been saying, um, they, they were completely in favor of the ASA boycott. Um, they, they said, uh, please do this. Uh, this was before the vote had taken place. This will strengthen our position. You know, we are marginalized. We are ostracized. Uh, here in Israel, and uh, resolutions like this strengthen us and make it make make it easier for us to speak out than than now. So let me also just um, say the way I imagine the boycott working. All right, um, there uh, the, the the people who have put themselves on the front lines um, in the way that Elon Pape and Anat Matar have are a very very tiny minority, but I hear over and over again. That, um, that many, many, maybe the majority of Israeli academics oppose the occupation. Um, that may be true. We don't see very much evidence of it. Uh, what are they doing to, to show that they oppose the occupation? Now, uh, on the assumption that, the, the, such, that BDS and, and resolutions like the ASA resolution will strengthen their hand, um, I would think that what this would do would be to uh, stimulate them to organize teach-ins on their campuses, to organize massive demonstrations um, uh, on their campuses, to go in delegations to the Knesset. You know, there are all sorts of things that they can do that they have not done. Well, uh, when I'm going to take some more questions. Uh, uh, that gentleman in the pink shirt there has been <laughs> trying to get attention. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to get you, and I'm going to get one more, and then we'll, uh, sir, please. Sure. Uh, thank you. For Professor Zarman, uh, you talk about boycott and presumably sanctions and these activities as not legitimate. Yet look at what both Israel and the U.S. are doing to Iran. And isn't that total hypocrisy that Netanyahu says what the ASA doing is a crime against humanity, but he can do the same to Iran? I don't think I, 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 you weren't listening. I don't think I was quoted correctly, but I'll get back to it. Go ahead. Oh, you, okay, we'll give you a little time to ruminate. You have been very patient. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to address my comment to Professor Wood. Um, when you talk about that, you feel that boycotts cut off dialogue, having worked for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and worked for the SCLC with Reverend Dr. Joseph mm -hmm. Lowry during the uh, boycott of the anti-apartheid movement, though I don't have a criminal record because I had to be the person to stay out of the bus. Mm -hmm. um, and coming from a community where, in the face of injustice, our immediate go-to, even through our churches, mm -hmm. is to boycott. We don't necessarily see that as a means of cutting off dialogue, but primarily we achieve justice when those who we wish to dialogue with do not hear us, will not dialogue mm -hmm. with us, will not hear our needs. And so in, in light of this and in terms of the history of it in this country, mm -hmm. I would also like to ask the members of the panel, when you're looking at on the ground conditions in Palestine, um, you know, is there a, with deliberate speed, that can be applied to 
could that situation be? Yeah, I'll take one more, and that's, uh, I'm tempted all the way, but Mr. Secretary Joe. Okay, it's just, uh, it strikes me that this is inimically against the basic freedom that America believes in. I, I, I was brought up on, or at least recently come to believe it very strongly in uh, Roosevelt's four freedoms, uh, freedoms from one, freedom of religion, freedom of fear, and freedom of expression. And the kind of thing you're talking about is, is fundamentally flawed, surely, because America stands for freedom, freedom of speech, above all else. And if America fails to stand for freedom of speech, how can it be any example to the rest of the world where the disgraceful things go on, the suppression of voices? You get a guy like Dan Meridor, for instance, who was Minister for Security in the last Netanyahu government, but it is it's to the extreme left of the uh, political spectrum as far as Likud is concerned. Very reasonable man who needs to be engaged. Uh, as, as it happens, he's out of government at this moment. But imagine that he was in government, or there are others of that caliber. And you say, you cannot speak to an American university because you are associated with the Israeli government. I mean, that really is so destructive of free speech, and it's so negative. It's such, a, it's such an awfully tragic example to the world. It's not the way to go. Okay, now we have three somewhat I see as related questions. But would you, sir, put your, uh, your view and question in one very pithy remark to the panel? Well, I just think we ought to compare the U.S. sanctions to Iran with the condemnation of BDS. Yeah, I, I think there's somehow in this debate a mixture of, of the subjects of sentences. Uh, you said uh, it, you, it, you justified what uh, was being done by what Netanyahu is de doing. I, I'm not Netanyahu. I do not represent Netanyahu. I am not of his uh, of either nationality or religion or anything on and on like that. So that they, they, it's somehow you're even grammatically missing the point. The same thing is true here in the answer. Uh, to activities, the Israeli professors, it was said, should do something uh, about the Israeli government. The United States government is doing things we disapprove of, and therefore we should do something about the Israeli government. The United States, if you were American citizens, we should do something about uh, the American uh, uh, policies, uh, and not directing it against uh, uh, some other government or group or so on. I don't know, I won't say you because I don't know what your background is, is in this regard, but there's a lot of activity to be carried out in regard to our own government against the, uh, about the very policies that, that you're, you're decrying. Let's get into some kind of activity of, of that kind. Now, you have a very good point. Can you make it in one sentence? Oh, I've already got it in one sentence. You, he's got it. I've got it in one sentence. Um, I would just make a differentiation between academic boycotts and economic boycotts. There's a real difference between saying, mm -hmm. I am angry at you, and to show how angry I am, I'm not going to buy your product, I'm not going to uh, support you economically, and say I'm angry with you, therefore I'm not going to talk to you. So can I and comment on this one yeah, as well? Sure. So, yeah. um, and this I think goes to the last uh, comment as well. Um, uh, Nothing you described actually is, is put in place by the ASA resolution. I think that there is a, and thank you for contextualizing boycotts for us. Um, it, it connects to what I was trying to say about normalization, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about um, uh, uh, bringing into a conversation uh, people who have been excluded from the conversation who are most directly by the conversation, right? And, and sort of learning from their political analysis. I think there's been uh, a conflation in this conversation between uh, institutional arrangements and relationships and the exchange of ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think that conflation is dangerous for us um, because it's what has been used as fuel against those mm -hmm. of us who are supporting the resolution. So uh, there's no silencing of people. There, I mean, there's, there's only, like, there, there's no lack of access to information. Um, you know, there's no blocking of resources. We're talking about institutional arrangements. So, so your examples of free speech and then your discussion of, like, shutting down conversation, those are, uh, I mean, at best, they're, they're, they're disingenuous, but I think they're like conflating in, in, uh, how we access information and how we learn and, and exchange ideas with, and this is why I think the <coughs> distinction between the economic and academic boycott is, is not as clear, because we're talking about institutions, their, their direct roles in, in holding up or challenging state policies and systems of oppression. And so the, the last thing that I want to say on that is, if what you were sort of asking for in your comments was hmm? more conversation, when 
when before the ASA resolution was both the question of academic boycott and the struggle of Palestinian justice a regular feature of mainstream news in the United States. So, like, we have gotten more conversation. The exact thing they are asking for is taking place because of BDS. What's happening is it's a different conversation than we're used to having, and it's a conversation that challenges the Israeli lobby and the US government, which supports it. And so it's a different conversation, but it's actually more conversation, and it's conversation in which people who have never been able to participate are, for once, leading that conversation. Yes, okay. Well, first of all, the fifth frequently asked question in the ASA list on the ASA website specifically says that it is a boycott against Israeli government officials and Israeli institutional like university presidents. And therefore, as the questioner indicated, that particular individual, when he held Israeli political office, would have been unwelcome on the campus. How we can have a debate between the Israeli and Palestinian positions without having legitimate representatives of the Israelis speak, I don't know. So from my point of view, from a basic sense of academic freedom, it's a violation. Secondly, yes, it's gotten uh, press attention, but it's absolutely the wrong attention. It hasn't gotten attention to the cause of the Palestinian people. It's gotten attention to the issue of suppressing free speech. It's the wrong way to get the attention. Run the ad calling for Palestinian academic freedom, calling for Palestinian freedom, period. Run ads in mm -hmm. support of the Palestinians. Lobby the American government, as Professor Zartman says, uh, and have demonstrate. I mean, you know, I was in every demonstration there was in Washington when we were dealing with the Vietnam War. Uh, have the demonstrations, have them, but fight over the principle of the rights of the Palestinians, not over uh, denying free speech to some Israeli institutions. It's simply the wrong way to have the fight, and it's a loser. I mean, what is going on in Congress? What is the response? Instead of getting the government to be more supportive of the Palestinian cause and more critical of Israel, and there is room for that, you know, the Israeli lobby is not all powerful. You could at least belong to J Street if you're Jewish like me and want the other side. Uh, but in any case, put the pressure on for the Palestinians, but not over this absurd fight uh, over a boycott that won't mean anything and that most faculty won't support. I regret that I've informed the Naval Academy officers 